Are we ready? Any announcements this morning? Good morning. I was so hoping that we would just kind of calmly finish up the school kids, but we have um, had wonderful, wonderful donations and more than twice from last year, double from last year. Um, but there's a couple categories. We don't need any more pencils. Um, we still need pens and rulers um, to try and, and match up the amounts. We're trying to get at least 100 kits and we're at 89 rulers and 99 pen sets. Um, the notebooks, we only have 87 notebook sets. So you guys, when you're shopping this week, if you wanna grab a couple more items in those categories, we can get them up to 100. So thank you. It's in the bulletin, but I just wanna point it out because uh, in two weeks, beginning in October, the open office hours of the church office are going to change from Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I think that'll just uh, give us some flexibility with what happens on Friday and just allow us to staff throughout the week uh, well. So if you have things that need to get in for the bulletin, uh, then it helps us to have those in on Wednesday so that we can make sure those get where they need to be uh, on Thursday when we'll be printing the bulletin. Again, that's got a couple weeks out, but just want to give you a heads up with that. All right. I'm filling in this morning for Ken Beachy because he couldn't be here this morning. <laughs> Except you're right there. That's annoying. <laughs> so you, you got what you got. Uh, for the call to worship this morning, a paraphrase of Psalms 33. Sing with a lot of joy and enthusiasm. It's the right thing to do because we serve a righteous God. We can make music with instruments or use our voices, but do it well. And this is here. Don't be afraid to shout out once in a while. In a Mennonite church, <laughs> that'd be wild. Why do we do this? Because God deserves it. God is right and true, and he is absolutely faithful in everything that he does. In fact, the whole world is full of his unfailing love. Let's worship together. morning. Please turn in your voices together to number 30. Number 30. Jesus calls us.
turn over to number 120. Number 120, please stand. over to number 80, number 80. <clears throat> we'll sing one, two, and four. Thank you. 
uh, prayer this morning for our offering. Lord, we thank you. Our life is all hidden in you, all that we have, all that we are. And we thankfully and gratefully give back to the work of your kingdom. Amen. Pass the peace. That sounds so good. Let's join together, remain standing, and join um, with me in singing page 182 in Voices Together. I sing the mighty power of God. to number 180, one page over, 180.
here and sit. Okay, how many of you guys had Isaac, a story about baby Isaac and God's promise today in Sunday school? Yeah, you did, Isaac. It just fell a bit late. Yeah, okay. All right, that's what I thought. I thought most people would have it. Most of you were in my class ha having the story of Isaac, weren't you? Yeah, then we made babies. It was good. Okay, we made little, little clothes pens. We made clothespin babies. Don't think like that. Okay. So we are going to do a different story now. We're going to do a different story. This is a story about, it's called I Promise, because I thought, you know, we should have a different story since we have to do the Isaac story in Sunday school anyway. And so I found this book. And this book is by someone named LeBron James. Do you know who that is? LeBron James. That's what it says. I did not know who LeBron James was, but he sounded very familiar, like somebody I maybe could know. So I looked it up, and he's a basketball player. And that's important because it talks a little bit about basketball in the story. So it's good to know that, OK? It helps to understand. All right. Eli, come over here. OK. It's called I Promise. I promise to work hard and do what's right, to be a leader in this game of life. I promise to go to school and read as much as I can, to follow the rules and respect the game plan. I promise to run full court and show up each time and let my magic shine. I promise to be open and try new things and enjoy the happy that change can bring. Does change sometimes make you happy? Sometimes. I promise to wear a big smile and use kindness when I speak, to remain strong yet humble with every win and defeat. I promise to ask for help whenever I need it, to reach for my star even when I can't see it. Do you always ask for help when you need it? Yeah, it's important to do. I promise to ask questions and find answers, to believe in next time and second chances. I promise to use my voice and stand up for what's right, and when things get tough, to keep up the fight. Yeah. 
I promise to stand tall, rise up, and give all I've got to throw the alley-oop and uplift others on the spot. I promise to respect my elders and peers the same, to le leave new places better than I came. Did you all leave your Sunday school class better than it was today when you showed up? Mm -hmm. Something to think about, yeah. I promise to stay true, keep my head up, and never give up no matter what. I promise to dream big and love bigger, to be a team player and a winner. I promise to be courageous, to be free, to strive for greatness. To be me. I promise. Do you promise to be you? Mm -hmm. To do all the things that it said? Some nice things in there, right? Yeah. A little bit in the... Back here, apparently there's a school, the I Promise School, and they promise that every day, which is interesting. Yeah, do you promise, make promises at school every day? No? You're homeschooled? You don't make promises every day with homeschool? Good, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to do. It would be interesting. It would help you to think at the beginning of the day about what's important, right? Yeah, help you focus. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we can promise what we wish to do for you, but it is only with you that we can achieve those things. So be with us this week as we go out and try to live your truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. There's quite a lot of scripture this morning. We'll start with Genesis 18, 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, where he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and he looked up, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran to the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself down to the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass your servant by. Please let me get a little bit of water brought to wash your feet, and a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by insomuch as you have come to your servant. And they said to him, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and he said, Quickly make three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And then Abraham ran out to the herd, took a tender good calf, gave it to a young man who hastened to prepare it. So he took the butter and the milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the trees as they ate. Then he said to them, Where is your wife Sarah? So he said to him, She is here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the normal time of life, and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him, and, and Sarah and Abraham were old, like really old. And Sarah was well past the age of bearing children. And therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have this pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is there anything that's too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall bear a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, nope, you laughed. It's an abrupt ending. <laughs> From Genesis 21, 1 through 7, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as she 
as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant. She bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God promised that it would happen. Abraham gave him the name Isaac. It, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son that Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight years old, eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said that Abraham and Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in my old age. Good to be with you this morning. Last Monday, I came down with something. Kept me out of the office all week, and it was finally on Friday that I started to feel a little bit like myself again. So, if I haven't gotten back to your call or text or email this week, my apologies. I'll be working on returning calls and emails soon. Um, and as usual, I want to thank Jana and Jody for the ways that you keep things going and rolling around here. Who knows? Maybe it was actually easier to keep things going when I wasn't around this week. So my apologies, I'll be getting caught up soon. Um, take this out of your bulletin, uh, if you have one, just because uh, I wanna acknowledge it, um, that we've included a weekly devotional. Uh, that's around, it's in your bulletin this week. Uh, and I wanted to give you another chance to see it because beginning next week, it's just gonna be on the back in the table. So if it's something you want to make use of, you're gonna have to be just a tad bit proactive and pick it up yourself. We're not gonna put it in the bulletin for you anymore, um, but I believe in you. If this is something that you're interested in, uh, yeah, I trust you'll be able to pick that up and take that home and make use of it. Uh, also, as you can tell, uh, it's probably a little bit more painful for you to listen than it is for me. Uh, I've got a little bit of that lingering congestion going on. Uh, so we'll just pretend it's not there and pretend it's not as painful for you because it's really not that bad from my perspective. So the Lord be with you. The last week was the beginning of the story, God's story, and the story that we find ourselves wrapped up in. Last week in Genesis 2, we looked at how this whole story of God began with God's actions, not ours. God called into existence all of creation, including humanity. And God also called into existence some partnerships. Partnerships within humanity and partnerships between humanity and God. One of the main functions of the story of Genesis for the followers of God was and is to remind us about God's promise of a partnership with us and to ask the question, what does faithfulness to that partnership look like? Whatever the time in history, whatever the physical location, cultural setting, what does it look like for God's listening people, the church at our best, to be faithful to our partnership with God? And what does it look like for God to remain faithful to the partnership with humanity? God created us in a desire for partnership. So partnership with God and with each other is what this story, God's story is about. This morning that story continues, but this week's story shows the origin of the people of Israel, people who are the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. And it further shows that God is true to the promises of the partnership. See, Genesis 18, it's, it's an interesting to story to me. I get, it's not all that surprising. I'm the pastor, I'm supposed to think everything about the Bible is interesting. That's my job. 
Uh, rest assured, I don't think everything about the Bible is interesting. There's a lot of stuff that, well, sometimes feels really boring. Um, but really, there's so many unexplained things, I think, in this passage, in this story, uh, things that are just left unresolved. It's like introduced and then it just sits there. There's this thing where God appears in the form of multiple people all at once. It says God shows up and it's three men walking together. Obviously that's Trinitarian. Well, maybe, but the catch is for the Israelites around 600 BC, when this story was kind of compiled, they didn't have any sort of doctrine or understanding of the Trinity, let alone a need to teach such an understanding. So, why does God show up in the form of multiple people? Eh, we don't know. That's what I kind of find interesting. There's just a few things we don't know. And one of the three men, is one of the three men actually God, and the other two are somehow just along for the ride? Did God split God's self into three distinct beings? And if that's the case, what would God use to differentiate those beings? What would be the benefit of drawing divisions? Would the message God is carrying mean more to Abraham, coming from a group of people instead of just one? Is Abraham losing his mind and seeing people who aren't there? And that's just how the story gets recorded. Or is he perfectly in tune with reality, Abraham? In just a handful of sentences, this passage starts to bring so many more questions than it does answers. Then, God speaks to multiple people all at once in the story. There seems to be this layering going on. It's clear that God's questions and promises are intended for Sarah, but he relays them to Abraham, even though he gives us readers a few hints that he knows Sarah is listening outside the tent. At the end, God even addresses Sarah directly, and what's the significance of God appearing and communicating in all these multiple layers all at the same time? Well, we get no real answers. Why three men at the beginning, and why talk to Sarah through Abraham, but then directly to Sarah? Well, another reason that I find the story in the first half of Genesis 18 interesting is that it sets up the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oftentimes, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, we, we skip the beginning of 18 and just jump in. But the story here in the first half of 18 shows the extravagant hospitality of Abraham and Sarah when they encounter a group of immigrants, strangers, people they don't know. And there's this stark contrast to the complete lack of hospitality shown to the strangers in Genesis 19. Contrast of Abraham's hospitality with that of the people of Sodom suggests that maybe the story and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah has to do with hospitality. The third reason why I find the story interesting is the laughter part. Sarah hears what's promised and she laughs aloud enough that she's questioned about it and fearing for her life, she lies. Nope, it wasn't me. I wasn't the one laughing. Must have been someone else. It was the sheep, the goats. <laughs> then in chapter 21, when the son is actually born, He's given the name Isaac, which means laughter in Hebrew. That could seem well, a bit cruel at first, making fun of Sarah's response. And now, for the rest of her life, whenever she calls out her son's name, she's reminded of that response. But the name's connection to laughter here has a different connotation. Instead of a mocking laughter, it's a joyous and playful laughter joy and play as at the end of sorrow and weeping. God brought laughter to Sarah amid heartache and amid uncertainty. But the tension here in the story isn't about Sarah's laughter or what it means that God appears in the form of three men or the various ways God seems to interact with Sarah while interacting with Abraham. The tension here in the story the question that remains uncertain is 
similar to the question last week. Will God be faithful to the partnership? See, back in Genesis 12, God makes a covenant with Abraham. It's a covenant that continues the partnership. It fills in not all, but a few of the details about how God is going to stay faithful to God's partnership that was started in creation. God's partnership would mean having a specific group of people that would represent God to all the nations and all the peoples of the world that would be a blessing to all the nations and peoples of the world. That way people could see what it looked like to trust God. Through Abraham and Sarah, God would bring up these people and their descendants would be as numerous as the stars and the grains of the sand. But those events hadn't happened yet. Nothing had happened to show that the descendants of Abraham and Sarah would be vast in number. In fact, just the opposite had been happening. They'd slowly grown to 99 years old without a sign of this partnership with God being fulfilled or even taking a step in the right direction. God's end of the partnership had some serious credibility issues. Maybe that had been caused by the people's unfaithfulness when God finally realized humanity was just a lost cause. Maybe it's that God just wasn't powerful enough or just plain forgot because God was busy doing so many other things. That's the tension in the story here as the people are telling it and retelling it to each other. Will God remain faithful to the partnership? And if so, how? Because this situation is completely laughable. See, it's that tension that's resolved in a miraculous way. When Sarah gives birth to Isaac in chapter 21, God remains faithful to the partnership and the laughter continues. Oh great, what does all that mean for us though? And I, I know better than to believe this means God's faithfulness to the partnership guarantees a baby born to everyone that wants one. Though I have heard people use this passage to claim such a thing. If you've just had enough faith like Abraham and Sarah. Nope. While certainly joyful, Abraham and Sarah's receiving Isaac is not God's promise of prosperity for all those with enough faith or with the right faith. And by the way, I'm sorry. If you were ever made to feel like something did or didn't happen because you didn't have enough of the right faith. The birth of Isaac shows God's faithfulness to the partnership with humanity because it's the beginning of that partnership being extended to all the peoples of the world. Through Isaac, God develops an entire people group that would be God's representatives. In the midst of our doubts, God is still working out faithfulness. Faithfulness to the partnership in ways we cannot always see. Ways we can't predict, ways we think impossible, or ways we wouldn't dream of in our wildest dreams. God's working out faithfulness to the partnership in ways that probably even seem laughable to us. God will meet us with things better and more absurd than we can imagine in more than one way. More than one time, drawing on many more people than just us until that time when we internalize those good and absurd things, until we realize that they are coming true and God is remaining faithful to the promise. Back in April of this year, New York Times columnist Jessica Cross, she began an ongoing series of articles that explore America's current and changing relationship with religion. The first article was titled, Lots of Americans Are Losing Their Religion. Have you? Jessica's articles and other articles on the topic of religious decline written by Nicholas Kristof, a cite recent book called The Great De-Churching. It's by Jim Davis and Michael Graham. And they write, more people have left the church in the last 25 years 
than all the people, all the new people who became Christians from the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening, and all of the Billy Graham Crusades combined. Granted, most of the studies about people leaving the church are focused on mainline and evangelical denominations, but I know those of us in other Christian traditions, we feel the tension just the same. In the midst of such times, it makes sense to ask questions, to seek understanding as to why people are leaving, to learn about the reasons for the decline. It's also easy to wonder what God is doing and question how God is continuing to work in the midst of such a decline in church attendance across the United States. Is this because we don't have enough faith? Had God given up on the promise and the partnership because of our unfaithfulness, this judgment? Any way out of this continued decline, or rather downward spiral, seems laughable. Like Abraham and Sarah, it might be easy to question whether God is still working or being faithful to the partnership. But we can also learn from Abraham and Sarah that God is working, often in surprising and outlandish and absurd ways that far surpass what we can even comprehend, ways that would cause us to laugh out loud. God is continuing to be faithful. God is bringing about a family far beyond Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. And even with our own unworthiness, God's partnership with humanity, it continues. In the midst of the questions, in the midst of the wondering, I'm also looking forward to being surprised by how and what God does. Hopefully, we'll even get a chance to laugh out loud together when we see it. response, let's please stand and turn to number 419. 419.
Jana Gingrich, associate pastor here at Zion. And this morning I want to um, have you, I want to guide you in our pastoral prayer. And at the end, we will say the Lord's Prayer together. This past week, some of my conversations with members of this church have been about angels and about creation and being out in nature to commune with God, to ask questions of God, to express doubts. So things are happening in our lives. And would you join me this morning with our prayers? God, you are the source of our lives. And you have loved us from the first day we were born. And we remember with deep gratitude your faithfulness to us in every season. You have walked beside us all of our days in times of light and joy, in times of struggle and heartache, in times of darkness and weakness, you have been our comfort and our friend and our savior. Lord, in every season, you have been our source of hope and you have taught us that we are surrounded by your deep love. Thank you for the care and love that we receive from each other. This morning we want to lift up Phyllis Lind and Norm Lind and their family, especially Phyllis to your care and keeping as she is on hospice. Thank you, Lord, for her loved ones, for her family and friends and neighbors. Thank you for these friendships. We ask that you would keep her in your safe keeping and give her peace. As she looks for your angels, as she journeys toward home. We lift today our world community and pray for those experiencing challenges all across our country and world. Brought by acts of nature, hurricanes, flooding, earthquakes, fire, and heat. And we pray for innocent lives affected by war, the greed of those in power, poverty, and other injustices. Lord, today we pray for those carrying burdens, those dealing with health challenges. You see them and you know their deepest needs. And we ask that you would lighten their heaviness with your healing love and grace. We ask that you would be with those with strained relationships, that somehow you would bring peace and understanding, reconciliation to those relationships. Lord, thank you for our children, for their presence with us this morning, for their joy, for their excitement about new things, and we ask that you would be with them in all of their activities at home or school, that you would protect them, you would give them friends, new friends, that you would bless their families. And together, we lift all of these concerns as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to have another song at this time, 840.
if you'll please turn to Voices Together 840. Please stand and join me in 840. <clears throat> Steve was preaching this morning, I was searching through the back to try to find a good oxology, and I was looking for something with laughter in it, and I realized that Mennonites don't laugh. <laughs> so this is what we've got. Eternal strength, hold us. Eternal hope, show us new life. Eternal goodness, grant us your grace as we live and work and play in this place and time and laugh with the people we love. Amen. Amen. 